This is the second of two videos, this video looking at lines 215 to 311. Today we're continuing with the poem's next section, The Fire Sumo. Lines 215 to 230. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, and the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing, waiting, I, Tiresias, though blind, probably between the two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, Evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. The type is home at tea time. Dinners and breakfast lie their stove and lays out food in tins. Out of the window, perilously spread, their drying combinations touching the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled at night her bed, stockings, slippers, canisters, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled doves, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I too awaited the expected guest. There's a lot to say about lines 215 to 256. It contains the midpoints, midpoints. I'd call it the poem's peak if, again, it wasn't the nadir. To start, lines 215 and 220 to 221, I think, are to subvert our expectations. Again, we're supposed to associate the violet sky, homeward, the sailor, home and the sea, with something healthy. In modern times, we may imagine it as Winslow Homer paintings, with the sailor wrestling with family's livelihood from the sea, and the wife waiting on the beach for her husband and his catch. Also, the evening hour is an hour of rest, but this imagery is more natural than 19th century, which is when Homer painted, I believe, the bulk of his works. When we think of wrestling one's livelihood in the 20th century, what is the first thing we might think of, this being what makes the poem still so relevant and fresh? The desk, at least describing the phenomenon of eyes turning back at the clock to see if it's time to go yet, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing waiting, leads us to talk about rhythm. There's a connection between a poet's rhythm and the rhythm of his or her age. A poet will often take his or her cues from the objects around him or her. It's the same with animals. If we pay attention to bird song, like a mockingbird, it incorporates the sounds, natural and unnatural, rather than to rhythmic unity. Thus, this is something that goes back to our animal natures. I believe it's Matheson who says that poetic rhythm renews the most primitive element of men's experience and gives expression to the last subtle nuance of animal feeling. This innate tendency for rhythmic incorporation as a practical side and an artistic side. For practical, we can think of the galley slave scene from Ben Hur, how the towers rode to the beat of the headmaster's drum. For artistic, we can think of, for example, the opening lines of Carpentier's Concert Baroque. This is lost in any translation, but if you read it in the Spanish, you will hear how the first page, with its repetition of plata, sounds like a minting factory. The process from the very pretty repeats. Silver. No better poet or artist will be attentive to the new sounds around him or her. Eliot, in incorporating jazz rhythms, the new fresh music of his age, broke away from 19th century poetic rhythms, and by the 20th century, into poetry. But there's another rhythm in the wasteland, the machine. I quoted the metronome in passing in my last video. Here I'll clarify the quote's origin. Ezra Pound apparently says it later at some point, but it was originally put forward by F.S. Flynn in three rules. For the images poets on screen now. These three rules would later expand to six, of note as the beginning of the second rule, to create new rhythms as the expression of new moods, and not to copy old rhythms, which merely echo old moods. I'll return to the images poets, any of the rules, in the section five video. There's a bit of irony in mainstream poetry, primarily being understood or appreciated in terms of rhyme. Poetry ideally should be like music. Musicians use metronomes to help with their music, but it often happens that in the poetry of so-called poets or rhymesters, the music is lost, but the metronome, the back-and-forth rhyming, remains. To return to Eliot, his poetry is fresh, not because it mentions a taxi, but because the human component of urban life is deeply rooted to, almost identical with, but most intimately informs its daily activity, the rhythm of its life, in lines that subtly catch the essence of that rhythm, the unending monotony, Repulsing machines. It may be lost on us. Our early 20th century cars were not ideal and were even seen with contempt. Most writers of Eliot's time, like Balser and Hesse, for example, derided the automobile. I'll share these two quotes for those interested. But it was not the midnight, and far and wide, neither of courtly Middle Ages, nor any year 1600 or 1800, but broad daylight and a working day, and a troop of people together with the most uncourtly, unknightly, most crude, 
most impertinent automobile which came my way, really disturbed me at my wealth of learned observations, and threw me in the trice out of the domain of castle poetry and a reverie on things past. I was swept at once into a world of noise and excitement. Cars, some of them armored, were run through the streets chasing the pedestrians. They ran them down, and either left them mangled on the ground or crushed them to death against the walls of the houses. I saw at once that it was the long prepared, long awaited, and long feared war between men and machines, now at last broken out. The rise weren't as smooth as they are now. One feature of cars a hundred years ago was the constant pulsating. But this was the new rhythm of life, or city life, replacing the horse and carriages rhythm, even within the poem. It's a deliberate degradation to go from jazz rhythms to engine rhythms, but I'll explain this more in a few minutes. At first glance, it looks as if the human body is likened to the machine. This is a thought that harkens back to Descartes in his Discourse on Method. We also get it in brief in Hobbes Leviathan's opening page. But what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings? and the joints with so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer. Yet our lines say, the human engine, not the human body. In the 1600s, the human body was likened to a machine. In the poem's line, the dehumanization goes a step further. Because the human engine, which is the human body already likened to a machine, is even further likened to another machine. As an aside, line 217 reminds me of another line. This one from White Noise. The helicopters throb by giant appliances, in which a big machine is likened to another smaller machine, a degradation of sorts, but not necessarily of kind. The Bernothelia was consciously or unconsciously thinking of the wasteland, but Eliot's fingerprints are felt everywhere in postmodernist fiction. Moving on, it's the same with mechanicality. It's this same mechanicality that we've seen elsewhere in the poem, and as it was connected with loss in those instances, it will be here as well. Also, the human machine is likened to a taxi. A city machine that has no unique goal. It just goes where it needs to go at the moment, or idles, throbs, in place until it has to go somewhere. And we are like taxis. If we fit the wasteland into the lost generation literature, like the great Gatsby, and the sun also rises, and compare the taxi to the characters of those books, it's a rather fitting comparison. Also, for this section's theme, plus, if we think of any connection it could have with motors, engine, and taxi, the human body could be seen as this machine in heat that needs to cool down, more dehumanization of both the human body and love. As for the next two lines, we have an introduction to Tiresias. For background, for our purposes, Tiresias was in two ancient Greek texts, the Odyssey and Oedipus Tyrannus, and one Roman text, Ovid's Metamorphosis. In the Odyssey, he wasn't the only spirit who retained his mind in the underworld. Odysseus goes to see him for advice on how to get home. In Oedipus Tyrannus, He's a blind prophet of Oedipus, has called for advice on how to expel the pollution affecting Thebes. The note here is that Thebes was in waste because of unnatural sexual relations. And thus echoes of both Weston's wasteland thesis and our Lansing Cup symbols. Finally, the metamorphosis as an origin story for Tiresias. Tiresias was famous for his unique experience of having existed at one time as a man and as a woman. One day, Jove and Juno argue about who gets the most pleasure out of sex. Job arguing the woman does, and vice versa for Juno. They get to asking Tiresias, and he answers that the woman does. Angered, Juno strikes him blind, yet Job, feeling pity for him, gives him the gift of prophecy. As for his entrance in the poem, let's look at why he's significant. In literature, he's consistently an authority figure, hence our Lance and Cup expert. Given the line throbbing between two lines, he could be impartial. He continues the poem's motif of linking ancient and modern elements, here him and the typist, as the poem previously did with Stenson and Eli and the Nymphs and City Directors. And we have another sage figure, this one to contrast with Madame de Sospis. The sage figure is an important element of the romances, not so much the fertility rituals. Still, the sage figure, typically supernatural in some sense, is someone the hero is supposed to go to for advice on his or her quest. Madame de Sospis was a sham. Tiresias is genuine. However, he's not any better off for being so, because he has no control over what he sees. And given that he is in the wasteland, what he sees is not anything that he would want to see. So let's move on to what he sees. He sees a typist at home, probably an apartment. She, or her home, is a little tacky because she sets the table in tins, not plates. And her divan doubles as her bed, in which her clothes are piled on. Her laundry is hung out to dry, 
the perilously of 224 is a bit ironic since, coming from the mutual romance, we associate this word with the perilous chapel. Final test of one's spirit. And here the word is used for her laundry being in a dangerous situation. Tiresias appears again, received the scene and foretold the rest. Here our proof that his art is genuine. Lines 231 to 242. He, the young man Carbuncular, arrives, a small house agent's clerk with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits, as a silk hat on a factory millionaire. The time is not propitious as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired. Endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once. Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response. And makes a welcome of indifference. Here, a line by line explication is less needed since it's mostly seen. There's a young man described as carbuncular. Carbuncular means gem, but here it means pimply. Also, this carbuncular may call to mind such in one's red rock, the will far cry from a gem. So, a young man who appears as more than he is joins his woman for a meal. Now, the meal might be here to remind us of line 213, or the mystic meal from fertility rites, the union into a mystery. Except they're not simpatico. She's bored. He's thirsty and decides now is as good a time as any. Here I link time at 235, as he wants a good time at 148. And if the word time reminds us of marvels to his quite mistress, and what was going on there with time, the contrast here is terribly disheartening. Also, the still at 238, with still the wolf pursues at 102. Except she's so bored and too indifferent to even say no to him, thus not even preserving something of herself. For the sacredness of the union. Even worse, he thinks it's okay that she's indifferent. Lines 243 to 256. Night Tiresias suffered all, and acted on the same divan of bed. I who sat by Thebes below the wall, and walked among the lowest of the dead, bestowed one final patronizing kiss, and groped his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half one thought to pass. Well, now that's done, I'm glad it's over. The lovely woman stoops to folly, and paces about her room again alone. She smooths her hair with automatic hand, and puts a record on the grandfather. We go to our notes section. Elliot says, Tiresias, although a mere spectator, not indeed a character, is yet the most important personage in the poem, uniting all the rest. Just as the one-eyed merchant and solar of currents melts into the Phoenician sailor, and the latter is not wholly distinct from Ferdinand, Prince of Naples, so all the women are one woman, and the two sexes meet in Tiresias. What Tiresias sees, in fact, is the substance of the poem. Scholars equivocate on how exactly or to what extent Tiresias is central to the poem. For us, it's enough that he's central. More importantly, what he sees is the poem's substance. On the Tiresias side, we have our degradation theme, this wise man or seer, having been reduced to, in the words of Wiley and Elman, the peeping Tom. Furthermore, unlike Acme and her Sweeney, he doesn't want to see this, but he's an unwilling victim of his gift. Further note the four suffered and the lowest of the dead. I take this to mean that for someone who was in Thebes during the plague and in Hades, these visions are a new low. On the substance side, I believe that all enacted means that this vision is typical of what he sees in the wasteland. Unfruitful lands and cup relations, including lustful sex or this vicious attack, neither capable of any higher goals. It seems a rather low subject for poetry, but there are two things I'll say here. First, Eliot may be like a Tiresias figure, a prophet. He sees what few others see, and it's not something he can turn off. If not for Eliot Tiresias, our only other prophet figure is Jean Baptiste Clemence from Camus de Fall, except Jean Baptiste leans into what he sees, whereas Eliot Tiresias would like to lean out of. Second, again, our background. Ancient fertility rituals. These were so practiced magic rites to heal via the fisher king, infertility in the vegetable, animal, and human worlds. But in the wasteland, there's no magic, just mechanistics. No healing, just hurting. And the goal is infertility, reproduction, nor rebirth. In his last moment, the woman's young lover leaves as if leaving a dark alley. I liken his action here, whoever left the knockoff Cleopatra in line 107. Returning to the typist, She's indifferent to it all. The last four lines give us an allusion to all of the goldsmiths, the vicar of Wakefield. Before the following lines, a woman was recalling her seduction. When lovely woman stoops to folly, and finds too late that men betray, 
the charm can smooth a melancholy. What art can wash her guilt away? The only art here her guilt to cover, to hide her shame from every eye, to give her penance to her lover, and wring her bosom is to die. In the old world, when a woman was wrong, for example, Lucretia, she would take her own life, when neither justice nor retribution was an option. I'm not saying this is right. It's that noting this ethos of a woman's sense of shame, and that this is what Iliad is wanting us to contrast, given that Iliad degrades in his illusions. It seems that in the modern world, since the typist doesn't care about what's happened, she may not even care enough to take her own life. On the one hand, it's good that she doesn't fall through with such an action. On the other hand, she lacks the self-worth that would justify something serious, like self-termination. In the last two lines, the automatic reinforces mechanized actions, and the gramophone goes to the motif of music in the wasteland. I've covered the musicality of Eliot's poetry, but not the music motif in the poem. On screen, I'm sharing most of the lines that directly and indirectly tie to music. Not musicality, but music itself. Songs. Why are songs so prevalent in this poem? Despite this poem being written a hundred years ago, if we think about 21st century life, how is this even more true? of our own times. Let's start with this. Music, of a kind, pervades all the activities of contemporary life, seeping through the disembodied conversation of mass eating centers, drifting from the wireless to accompany all facets of experience. The principal objections to music, provided by the now almost universal loudspeakers, are its monotony and unsuitability. Now no one can avoid listening to music, whether in the town or country, in a motor car, train, or restaurant perched on a hilltop, or immersed in the river. Keep in mind that these quotes were published in the 60s and 30s, respectively, and now these poem was written in the 20s. While we now have headphones, how more true is this environment to finding music everywhere we go? One interpretation of the wasteland that I've enjoyed is that the poem is an experience of modern life, how in going about one's day, one is bound to catch snatches of conversation, bird song, music, nonsensical sounds, and even religious preaching. Similar to this, another interpretation I enjoy is that what we are reading are all or almost all sounds from a gramophone, possibly skipping between tracks. Just as Eliot's references are on record, we are hearing them as distorted records from a gramophone, and that the poem is musical like a vinyl recording. Putting the music motif aside for a moment, if we isolate these 14 lines, they can be seen as a sonnet, except remembering our irony theme, it's terribly depressing. Typically, the sonnet was to extol a woman's beauty or to describe love. Generally, the more interesting ones aren't as typical as this, but something was praised or defended. For Elliot, this is what a sonnet would have to be about in the wasteland. There's also a stylistic irony in going from the jazz rhythms to a sonnet. Up till this point, the poem has somewhat spoiled us with its music, but when we get to this sonnet, the poem has become less musical, almost, keyword being almost, disappointing which does not fit the subject matter. But according to Matheson, here the poem has a deliberate mechanization created by these 14 lines. Now the poem sounds more machine-like, which fits given the automatic and gramophone. But just as importantly, the motions, and only the motions, of love between the typist and the young man. Lines 257 to 265. This music crept by me upon the waters, and along the strand of Queen Victoria Street. O oh, city, city, I can sometimes hear, beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street, the pleasant whining of a mandolin, and the clatter and the chatter from within. The fishmen lounge at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold, inexplicable splendor of Ionian white and gold. Except for the poem's closing message, these lines are the only ones in which something neither ugly nor degraded is described. And once we keep in mind where we've come from so far, in the previous sections provided by the members in brackets. In contrasting with what's here, it's easy to see why. Because of this, I'd say lines 257 and 265 are the easiest to analyze. This music crept by me upon the waters was an allusion to the tempest, but it should also remind us of line 187's The wrath crept softly through the vegetation. From a wrath to music acting as a transition is an improvement. It's also an improvement since the music crept was moving us from the previous lines, the type of song. It's also ironic, since in The Tempest, these lines are about finding love. We're transitioning from negative to positive. The strand in the Queen Victoria Street bring us closer to water, 
a possible improvement. We have to wait until we get more information on the wattage environment. Now here's our first break, but not one we can notice until we've read the poem through at least once. The O City City is a motif of the Unreal City at line 60, 207, and 377. Also notice the Unreal is missing, since we have something not automated in our automaton mode, line 60, no sterile, line 207. But there's a qualification, the sometimes, which Brooks and his S.E. and Elliot points out to us. And sometimes they're to remind us that this scene or situation isn't absolutely good or not absolutely unreal. Real life is really so unconditioned. In any event, the public bar provides a contrast to the pub in section 2, and the lower temp street another contrast, this one to three degraded sweet temps from earlier. And going off from annotated footnotes to other waistline additions, the pub in section 2 is dingy or low end, but it seems this can only be had at by the conversation in the pub scene. The public bar in these lines is different. The pleasant whining and clatter and chatter indicate signs of life, meal prep and dining, Contrast this with hush rooms, rats alley, and section 3's desolation is really so far. One more point on the public bar. At this point we've seen the three classes. The upper class in the Cleopatra knockoff, the lower class in the pub, and the middle class in the public bar. There are two things in the lower fishmen lounge in Rome. The fishmen remind us of the Fisher King. In lower Thames Street, we have fishermen, those who give allegiance to the source of life. Not only this, but they are by the river and the church. The river represents life, and the church represents authority, and the unit is to be contrasted with Mr. Eugenides, who elicits a sterile love, at the same time the fishermen are dining in healthy camaraderie. Likewise, if we think on the typist meal, contrasting it with the fishermen's meal, Magnus Mater of the church, Galli wrote a pamphlet defending churches from being demolished in the business sections of London. He thought having them there kept a certain beauty in the financial district. Naturally, the last two lines express this, or something akin to it, and for contrast purpose, I contrast the white and gold to the ivory and colored glass in section 2. Lines 267 to 278. The river sweats, oil and tar. The barges drift, with the turning tide, red sails wide, to leeward, swing on the heavy spar. The barges wash, drifting logs, down Greenwich Reach, past the Isle of Dogs. Lila la, laya, lava la. Laya, Laya. Previously, I mentioned the quest through the pilgrim, the idea that there is a protagonist crossing the wayside in search of something vital. The question of a pilgrim in the poem is very problematic because, unlike a traditional quester, like in the Odyssey or the Divine Comedy, it's never clear where, when, or how the quester is in the poem at any given line sequence. For example, is this something the pilgrim overhears, something remembered, a state of his or her psyche? Or something else entirely. We use lines 266 to 278, 279 to 291, and 292 to 305 as evidence that there is indeed a quester, at least here, and that he or she is venturing out in search of a life giving element. Appropriately enough, this journey out and away from the wasteland takes place on water, but as mentioned before, this need not be taken so literally or spatial. This venturing out could be spiritual or a state of the psyche incorporating real-world locations or objects. But to preview section 4, is a danger in this quest because we had an disastrous secular warning, fear death by water, which I'll cover next time. The lines, the river sweats oil and tar, and as some more of Elliot's irony, oil and tar precious resources to modern civilization. There were in ancient times too, but with no modern machines to extract and process, ancient peoples could stand to be not so dependent on them. Now this oil and tar is trash when in our water. Water should be more rich, more naturally rich, than oil and tar, and it is whether we recognize it or not. But the treasures that are oil and tar are polluting the first, a real treasure, water. And again, this need not be interpreted so literally, but spiritually, but what water means, and what oil and tar could stand in for. All this, and the river sweats it, like it's trying to get rid of it. Oil and tar could be compared to soda water, all poor water substitutes. I'll return to the water in a moment. The quester is traveling on a polluted river. The next lines give us some imagery of what the quester would see. Notice we have actual barges. Not an ironic and watered down allusion to a barge from section 2's beginning. Also, the Isle of Dogs water connection can be contrasted with the dog that's friend to men, death with lack of rebirth connection at the end of section 1, and past the Isle of Dogs, 
The Thames is called Greenwich Reach. Lines 277 to 278, 291 to 292, and line 306 are all references to Wagner's The Cotter Dameron, in which the Lion Daughters bewail the loss of their gold. We get this wail three times. Instead of quoting Wagner, I'll share this quote found from the Chittle Romance, because the romance is similar enough to Wagner's. It opens with the passage quoted above, in which Master Grihas utters a solemn warning against revealing the secret of the Grail. He goes on to tell how, before time, there were maidens dwelling in the hills who brought forth to the passing traveler food and drink. But King Amangond outraged one of these maidens and took away from her her golden cup. His knights, when they saw their lord act thus, followed his evil example, forced the fairest of the maidens, robbed them of their cups of gold. As a result, the springs dried up, the land became waste, and the court of the rich fisher, which had filled the land with plenty, could no longer be found. There was more than one romance, and Von Eilig got his source material from this one or a variant. For our purposes, this connection to the wasteland should be immediately apparent, especially if we see the cups and their facts for what they symbolize. The cup symbolizes the female reproductive energies. Cups are stolen by men. This improper lance and cup relation results in the land going bad. This is the story of the young man and the typist from earlier and the theme of lust for section 3. Of course, in the romance, it's greed, but it's the wasteland equivalent is lust. Here, the sturdying up of lance and cup relations, resulting in the land going bad, also explains the dirty water as both are sources of life except Elliot as the water's dirtied up with something modern, secular, I'm assuming. But we can look past this to another deeper meaning, if we so choose. Having spoken about the cups and their thefts, or what both symbolize, we may ask ourselves what the cult symbolizes. With a from romance to ritual look at this poem, mentioned in my first and second videos, this their meaning of the poem rejects, further progressing the spear of destiny and the holy girl's evolution from lance and cup respectively, in place of a return to a primitive lens and cup, and then more universal significances, there is one quote I'd like to share. I'll share the whole quote on screen, but only quote it partially. When a country or a town is conquered, it is looted, and the prized objects of booty are women and gold. Without taking possession of the representatives of the female principle of the conquered realm, the principle that embodied Mother Earth, the very fertility of the soil that has been conquered, the victor would hardly feel himself victorious. So whether we are dealing with gold, cups, or cups of gold, there's a feminine association, especially if there is theft involved. Also earlier, I quoted Eliot's note on Tiresias. In this note, Eliot speaks of the characters melting into each other. I won't go into detail about this except to note that we should connect the Thames nymphs with the Ryan daughters. And I said earlier to pay attention to our threes and fours, Notice that there are three in Sweet Thames in the Nymph stanza, and three whales in our Rhine Daughter stanzas. As to why, it's because of the poem's stream of consciousness, its nature as a literary form to present without clear boundaries or distinctions. Like our thought patterns, our thoughts kind of melt into each other. Lines 279 to 291. Elizabeth and Lester, eating oars, the stern was formed, a gilded chill, red and gold. The brisk swell rippled both shores, southwest land, carried downstream, the peal of bells, white towers, Lila La, Laya, Lava La, Laya, Lila. Elizabeth is Queen Elizabeth I, and Lester is Lord Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester. There's another person we have to mention, Alvarez de Quadra, Spanish ambassador at Elizabeth's court. He's the original author of Elliot's reference a letter which is published in translation in Frode's book on the history of England. Before I cite the letter, it's important to understand its background. At the time, Elizabeth was young and there was a curiosity as to whom she would marry. The top candidate was Lord Dudley, highly favored by Elizabeth. However, Lord Dudley is married, and when his wife dies, there's a rumor that he had something to do with it. He gets banished from the court until he's found not guilty. When he returns, things pick up where they left off between him and Elizabeth I. The Quadra's interest in their potential marriage was because Lord Dudley had some pro-Catholic leanings, and the Quadra sees this as an opportunity to bring Catholicism back to England. However, the potential marriage doesn't work out because Lord Dudley is opposed by the Council of State, headed by William Cecil, who is anti-Catholic. This decision disappointed the Quadra. All this out of the way. Let's look at our reference. 
Again, this letter is from the Quadrant 41. Let's go to first and Lord Dudley. She listened patiently and thanked me for my advice. In the afternoon, we were in a barge, watching the game on the river. She was alone with Lord Robert and myself on the poop. When they began to talk nonsense, we went so far that Lord Robert at last said, As I was on the spot, there was no reason why we should not be married, if the Queen pleased. He said that perhaps I did not understand sufficient English. I let them trifle in this way for a time, and then I said gravely to them both that if they would be guided by me, they would shake off the tyranny of those men who were oppressing the realm in them. They would restore religion and good order, and they could then marry when they pleased, and gladly would I be the priest to unite them. But the heretics complained that they dared. With your majesty at her side, the queen might defy danger. At present, it seems she could marry no one who displeased Cecil and his companions. On the surface, the barge strikes us. This barge to be contrasted with the absent barge on section two's beginning was the healthy water reference. The top nonsense might be a reference to the wasteland poem itself. The marriage reminds us of our Lancet Cup rituals and the restore religion in good order sounds like Elliot himself, or at least the restoration of religious patriarch. There's a little contention as to how positively or negatively to interpret line 279. What strikes us as immediately different is that, in contrast to other scenes in section 3, in Elizabeth and Lord Dudley's story, we have what looks like a love story. And this is the contention, in that Shakespeare's Cleopatra and Elizabeth I are each royalty and have a love story, it would seem these two are meant to be compared thus having us read Elizabeth I as a deliberate contrast with Section 2's mock up Cleopatra. Yet I believe them to be compared. For one, there's a connection to Spencer's Berthalamian, as another Earl of Leicester is mentioned in the poem. This is something taking us back to Section 3's beginning. Remember that in the original, it is a wedding song. A couple should have married, but there was no wedding, just as with Elizabeth and Lord Dudley. Next, and here an indebted to the Signet Edition's footnotes on the wasteland. There's the belief that Elizabeth and Lord Dudley's relationship wasn't serious. At least the potential marriage part wasn't. I think there's textual support for this. If we look at the Quadra's language, he describes them as talking nonsense and trifling. He offers to marry them on the spot, which may or may not be plausible, and Elizabeth possibly makes a joke of his offer. He then says he spoke gravely on the issue, but ultimately they weren't married. Even if they were in love and didn't marry, it was a childless affair. Thus, only sexual relations, but no reproduction, the purpose of union, infertility rituals. And there's, of course, the politics, which may be reason why. But there's also the belief, not in the letter, that they were already lovers. Hence, maybe why they didn't feel the impetus for marriage. Finally, there's the Ryan daughter's wailing, which can't cast this scene in a positive light. It's my opinion, given Section 3's theme, that Elliot believed them to be lovers, which is why they didn't go through with the marriage or united by some guide or authority, and didn't bring religion and good order to the land. It fits better with all our textual clues, and Section 3's criticism of lust. Also, I believe it's Elliot's credit, that if Section 3's vignettes were all modern, it would lead us to believe that this is only a modern problem. But in fact, as I stated earlier, the Buddha sermon is for all time, it being just as true in his time, as in Elizabeth I's, as in our time. Lines 292 to 305. Trams and dusty trees. Highbury bore me. Rich men in queue undid me. A rich man I raise my knees. Supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are unmarked. And my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails of dirty hands. My people. Humble people, who expect nothing. Mama, we're back in the city, or a memory of the city. The tram cars and dusty trees. The line Highbury bore me, which went in the queue and did me, is a reference to Dante's Purgatorio. Sienna bore me, the mare Maron did me. In Dante's poem, the woman who speaks this line might have been murdered by her husband, either so he could marry another woman, or because she was unfaithful. Not that either is historically true, but whichever is true, or maybe both, either is consistent with the Section 3 theme. As to other reasons for this line, elsewhere, Elliot often speaks of purgatories for finding fire. I don't read the Purgatorio much, so can't speak to this, but this idea does remind me of Thomas Randolph's. Not dull and smoky fire, but heart divine. 
that burns not to consume, but to refine. This type of fire is different from Section 3's fire, specifically the woman who says that she was undone, in contrast to the purgatorial counterpart who had some hope because the latter's in purgatory. As for these locations, Highbury is a drab or gloomy suburb of North London, according to secondary sources, and Richmond and Kew are banks on the Thames. The most telling word is undid, which has sexual undertones, but not necessarily. For example, we can speak of a fatal fall being a character's undoing, yet here, because of Section 3's theme, the word carries those connotations. The speaker was undone by Richmond and Kew, whose action may be having some irony, since both areas are by the Thames, our water source. The next two lines are a little vague. I believe it's sexual in nature, like with Undid. I'm basing this more on an earlier version of the Wasteland, bits of which are in the more critical edition. Also, being supine on a canoe doesn't leave room for much else. Assuming it's the same speaker, the next lines give us enough context as to how to interpret Undid. So there's an event for which her partner made shows of amends. The event is probably another vicious attack, another unfruitful or bastardized Lancy Cup relation, just as with the typist, and a show of amends made by a male is a new start. The latter may be subtle, but this could be more of Elliot's irony. A male making a new start should remind us of the rebirth or revival of the buried god or the fisher king from the fertility ritual, except here, given the context, it's a warped version of what it once stood for. It's similar, albeit not as intense, with the fact that the he in the poem wept. The water's arrival from a reborn fisher king is supposed to be cause for celebration. As for Morgate, it was apparently a slum in East London. Heart under her feet could mean that something sacred was trampled upon. Margate Sands is a beach. It was also a resort on the Thames Estuary. In early its time, it also expanded with large-scale tourism. For the speakers at a beach, we see water source, yet it's been commercialized. Also remember that she was victimized near a water source, just like her line daughters. Despite being near a life source, her speech drops to being similar like that of a female speaker in Section 2. Finally, I believe that humble people is a reference to her highberry origins and her curtailed line daughter's wail to close it out. Lines 306 to 311. To Carthage then I came, burning, 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 burning. O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. O oh Lord, thou pluckest, burning. The last lines are allusion to St. Augustine and his confessions. I'll share the references first. I sank away from thee, and I wandered, O oh my God, too much astray from thee my stay. In these days of my youth, and I became to myself a barren land. To Carthage I came. But they sang all around me in my ears, the cauldron of unholy loves. I love not yet, yet I love to be loved, yet I love to love, and out of a deep-seated want. I hated myself for wanting not. I saw what I might love, in love with loving, and safety I hated, and away without snares. How I did burn then, my God, how did I burn to remount from earthly things to thee. But I, my God, in my glory, do hence also sing a hymn to thee, and do consecrate praise to him who consecrateth me. Because those beautiful patterns which through men's souls are conveyed into their cunning hands come from that beauty which is above our souls, which my soul day and night singeth after. But the framers and followers of the other beauties derive thence the rule of judging of them, but not of using of them, and he is there, though they perceive him not, that so they may not ponder, but keep their strength for thee, and not scatter it abroad upon pleasurable weariness. And I, though I speak and see this, Entangle my steps with these beauties. For thou pluckest me out, O Lord, thou pluckest me out, because thy loving kindness is before my eyes. Immediately we notice the phrases. I became to myself a barren land, the Carthage I came, where they sang all around me in my ears, the cauldron of unholy loves. But I, my God, in my glory, and hence also sing a hymn to thee. How I did burn them, my God, and did I burn to remount from earth the things to thee. And I, though I speak, see this, entangle my steps with these beauties, but thou pluckest me out. For some context, Augustine was living a hedonistic life when he went to Carthage. In hindsight, he sees, and sees it better for what it was, he was living and looking for the wrong kinds of love. The repeated burning here brings us full circle to Buddha's fire sermon, 
it would be very selective only to focus on the passion of the sermon and Augustine. In the sermon, all things are on fire, including the pleasant ones, and with the absence of passion, one becomes free. Put into Eastern religion's language, when one ceases to be ensnared in Maya, one escapes samsara and achieves nirvana. Compare this with Augustine's, and I, though I speak and see this, entangle my steps with these beauties without plucking me out. It's quite similar. Eliot's message may be that one can either go to Eastern or Western route with checking one's passions. There is some support for this, according to Spender. They transform their prominent Hindu and Buddhist elements in the wasteland into Christian analogs is a presumption not grounded in the poem. In remembering Eliot, Spender reports, I once heard him say that at the time of the poem, he seriously considered becoming a Buddhist, and rightly observes, a Buddhist is as eminent as a Christian in the wasteland. In not only sexual passions, the passions find expression everywhere, in vehicle, in anything. This concludes our look at section 3, the fire sermon. Next, we'll be looking at section 4, Death by Water. If you found any of this video helpful to your understanding of the wasteland, please consider giving it a like and joining me next time.